Okay, who's ready? We're all ready? Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first press conference of fall meeting. Um, so our first press conference this morning is the importance and vulnerability of the world's water towers. And our speakers are Tobias Bolsch from the University of St. Andrews, Aurora Elmore from the National Geographic Society, and Walter Immerziel from Utrecht University. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm quite excited uh, to present here to you uh, the results of uh, a project that we've been working on for the last year and that has been published this morning in, uh, in Nature. This uh, initiative was, uh, was started by National Geographic and we worked with a group of uh, 32 authors from all over the world on, the, on this project. Um, this project was about uh, mountains and the importance of mountains and the vulnerability uh, uh, that they have. So mountains, they are really uh, often seen as the water towers of the world, and that is basically for three different reasons. First of all, uh, you know, everyone who's ever walked in the mountains knows that when you go higher, there's, there's more rainfall, so they generate a lot of rain runoff. But in addition, a very special feature is that a lot of the precipitation falls as snow and uh, in the mountains, and that is either stored as glaciers or, uh, or as uh, snow packs. And these snow packs and glaciers, they act as a, as a buffer. So they release water in times when there is no rain downstream. So as such, they are a very important water supplier. So mountains are of tremendous importance for irrigation. There are many irrigation systems around the world which are fed almost exclusively by, uh, by mountain water. And in addition to irrigation, uh, mountain water is also very important for hydropower. Uh, there is a huge hydropower potential in mountains and only a fraction of that potential has actually been utilized. So that also plays a very important role in solving the energy crisis. Uh, another important role that mountain water has is to supply uh, water to cities. Here on the top you see a picture of Kathmandu, which receives all of its water from the surrounding mountains. And they've even uh, constructed a large diversion project where they take water from outside uh, Kathmandu Valley and transport it to the valley to supply this ever-growing demand of water due to the increasing population. So it's not only water supply, mountains also have an important religious role, and there are many, uh, for example, here you see a picture of the Ganges River at Varanasi, and annually there are millions of uh, pilgrims that travel to those holy places which are often associated to mountain water. So although everyone has this general feeling that mountains are important, there is not really a consistent way to calculate how important they are. And that was exactly the objective that we had in, in our study. So we designed a, a water tower index, which is basically a compound index of a supply index and a demand index. So in the supply index, we integrate elements like the amount of glaciers, the amount of snow, the amount of precipitation, the amount of lakes that we find in the mountains. And on the demand side, we look at the demand for irrigation water, for industrial water, for domestic water, but we also look at environmental flow. So we deem a mountain to be important if it scores very high on both the supply side and the demand side. So this is basically the final, uh, final result of our study. You see here the water tower index uh, in colors. So if a polygon is blue, it means a mountain range is, uh, is very important. A water tower is very important. And you see here the top 20 most important water towers around the world, five in each continent. And when we look at the amount of people that, that live in all those uh, mountain dependent areas, it's about 1.6 billion people. And there are about 300 million people who live actually in the mountains. So that already shows how important uh, the mountain ranges are. Um, one key region that is really important and that really popped up in our analysis is, uh, is High Mountain Asia. So in the, top, in the top five, three of the water towers are located in this area. And those are the Indus, the Amadaria, and the Tarim Basin. So in all of those cases, we see that in those basins, you have downstream very large irrigation areas in combination with arid climates. And if you look in the mountains, for example, in the Indus, we have the largest amount of glaciers there. Uh, outside the polar regions and also uh, yeah, a lot of, lot of snowfall. So that together, all that meltwater is stored in huge dams which supply the, the largest irrigation scheme in the world. So after we ranked all those, uh, those water towers in terms of importance, we have also looked at their vulnerability. And we looked at a number of uh, indicators in, in this context. 
we, we looked at the present day situation. So we looked at how water stressed is a, is a, a river basin already. Um, we looked at water governance, at the geopolitical situation, and then we also considered a number of future changes because they will, of course, impact both the water availability and the water demand. So we looked at climate change and also at uh, the growth in gross domestic product and, um, and uh, population growth, of course, because those together will drive the demand. And then one of our key conclusions there was that the most important water towers are also among the most vulnerable ones. So what we recommend in our study is that we should re really recognize mountains as a global asset of the Earth system. And with that we mean that there should really be, uh, yeah, dedicated policy should be developed uh, to make sure that mountain ranges are on top of the political agendas. We also have to acknowledge that the vulnerability of the water towers is driven both by socioeconomic changes and by climate change. So it's not only climate change that will influence uh, the water supply from the mountains, but I think the socioeconomic factors may even be stronger in driving a, a huge increase in demands in the, in the, in the coming years. So it's, it's essential to develop mountain-specific uh, conservation and climate change adaptation policies to protect and preserve these, uh, these beautiful mountain systems. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to give the floor to my colleague uh, Aurora Elmore from National Geographic, who will uh, show you a visualization uh, that we have developed based on, uh, your, on our results. Thank you, Walter. In addition to viewing the status of the world's water towers, as well as the implications of future changes on these critical life support systems, I want to reiterate that the index score for each water tower is comprised of a litany of scientific data that warrants further exploration. The supply of water to each water tower is made up of measurements of glacier, snow cover, precipitation, and surface water. The demands on that water tower result from requirements from households, industry, irrigation, and the natural environment. As you see here from figure four of the Nature paper, using the Indus Basin as an example, each of these components is also made up of subcomponents, and there's a lot of data existing here. So in order to allow non-expert viewers to probe this data and better understand the status and fate of water towers around the world, as well as their favorite water tower, we have also created a dynamic visualization. In the water tower index visualization, uh-oh. which is not, right, oh, there we go. Uh, which I would love to show you. There we go. In the water tower index visualization, users can explore the rankings for each water tower with the highest index values indicating the most reliance and shown in the darkest turquoise color. The globe view allows you to visually compare index values among different water towers or explore the rankings all around the world. So you can see the difference between high mountain Asia that Walter just highlighted compared with North America, South America, and other regions around the globe. When you click on one individual water tower, and we're about to click on the Indus here, which is the most important water tower, uh, you can see a close up of the area covered by that water tower. The menu on the left shows the water tower ID that corresponds to the nature paper, as well as the countries covered by the water tower, in this case, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and China. Users can then navigate between other layers to view supply and demand and vulnerability data for that particular water tower. The supply index shows the area within the water tower that supplies water to the downstream basin. Users can also explore more detailed data on the glacial volume, precipitation, snow cover, and surface water using the left-hand menu. In the right-hand menu, you can see that the water tower, how the water tower compares to other water towers around the world. Similarly, so here you see precipitation for the Indus. Indus is incredibly high, and out of all of the 78 water towers, the Indus ranks eighth of highest precipitation. Similarly, you can explore more detailed data on demand from households or domestic use, agriculture, industry, and natural environments. In the right-hand menu, you can also see how the water tower compares to others around the world for a particular component of demand or for total demand. So here you can see the Indus demand compared to other water towers in high mountain Asia. 
You can also compare and contrast to other regions around the world, such as the Columbia River Basin and the Pacific Northwest, not far from where we are today. And here you can see that the precipitation is lower for this region, but the total index value for the, the Pacific Northwest, uh, which we'll get to in just a second, uh, is I think sixth out of all of the 78 water towers, making it the most important in North America. In our changing climate, all 78 water towers are increasingly vulnerable. Walter talked about how not just climate change, but also governmental effectiveness and other socio-political factors are important for the vulnerability as well. Uh, so he's already shown this figure, but I just wanted to highlight all seven different components are critically important for whether or not a water tower is vulnerable or will become increasingly vulnerable in the future. So back to the visualization. Uh, you can drive more deeply into the vulnerabilities for each individual water tower, as well as the rankings for each vulnerability factor shown in the right-hand menu. Here you see predicted temperature change from 2000 to 2050 for each water tower around the globe, with some regions expecting to see a temperature rise of up to 3 degrees C by 2050. Then you can also see the predicted change in precipitation around the world, uh, which we'll see in just a minute. We're still looking at the difference in temperature. Here's change in precipitation around the world. And you can see a wide range of values with some water towers needing to support growing population and some needing to support less population. So you can see, for instance, that high mountain Asia looks like it might receive a little bit more rain, whereas there's regions of North America and especially South America that will be much more arid moving into the future until 2050. Next, we can look at the change in population around the world, uh, where South American population is predicted to stay relatively even, perhaps a little bit increased. But there are other regions around the world shown in this dark purple, where you can see population is expected to decline. And when we get to high mountain Asia, you'll see really extreme population growth increases. That means more and more people are going to require these water resources, of which, of course, they are limited. The Water Tower Index was supported by National Geographic and Rolex's Perpetual Planet Partnership, which works at a global, regional, and local scale to better understand Earth's life support systems, measure how they're changing, and drive solutions. From Walter and I, you've seen some of our global efforts to understand water towers holistically. This partnership also supported the multidisciplinary expedition to Mount Everest in April, May of this year. Here is, as part of that expedition, Mario Pataki of the University of Maine with our fantastic Sherpa support team collecting the highest ice cores ever extracted. Uh, he's about 8,030 meters above sea level here. Um, and their efforts will provide the first ever direct data from over 8,000 meters on how climate change has, how, how, on how climate has changed over the last few millennia. Similarly, our meteorology team, led by Tom Matthews and Baker Perry, were successful in setting up two highest weather stations in the world, including this one on the balcony of Mount Everest. It's 8,430 meters above sea level. And you can view live stream data from all five weather stations on our website. Here's a little uh, screenshot I took last night where it was minus 32 degrees C uh, near the top of Mount Everest. So we're all glad to be in San Francisco instead of that. Uh, this is Mount Everest Base Camp in Nepal, which is rebuilt every year on the foot of the Kumbu Glacier. And this is where our science team, along with many other climbers, spent many weeks this past spring working to understand changes to this critical water tower. In the next presentation, Tobias Volk will show another component of our broader work to understand how climate change is affecting Earth's critical water tower systems. Tobias is using remote sensing to determine the rate by which the Kumbu region, of which Base Camp is one, and the highest glacier in the world, uh, which is part of the Ganges Brahmaputra water tower, and how this region is losing its ice. Thank you. Well, good morning. So you nicely heard during the last two presentations that the most vulnerable water towers are in high mountain Asia. You heard that glaciers are quite important for water supply. 
So I will now focus on the climate change impact on Himalayan glaciers. We'll first present a broader overview and then focus on the Kumbu region to use some really nice data sets which allow us to look at six decades of mass changes in this region. And I specifically want to thank my two postdocs, Owen King and Atanu Bhattacharya, who did most of the work I'm presenting today. Last week, there was a paper published, not in Nature, but Scientific Reports, where we looked at the glacier changes since 1974 over the entire Himalayan arc. And what we found that throughout the Himalaya, there was significant mass loss, which without exception increased since 2000. Well, these findings are not completely new, but what, is, what we found new is that there are some regions where you see here that the more or less the mass loss stayed relatively similar in central west, so that's part of western Nepal. However, there are other regions, for example, in eastern Himalaya, here, where you see there was a significant increase in mass loss. And when you look a little bit more in detail, you see here these red dashed lines. And these red dashed lines are glaciers which terminate into glacial lakes. So, which means that those glaciers which terminate into glacial lakes have a significant higher mass loss than those without glacial lakes, which is important finding because these were facts were so far not considered in future projection, which means that the mass loss in the, of the future of Himalayan glaciers or others maybe or very likely are underestimated because they didn't take in town, into account these effects. So let us zoom now in the Everest region where we didn't find suitable hexagon data. Hexagon is data from US spy satellite mission, which was flown, um, well, around the 1970s to 80s, but there are nice other data sets available. So we have the chance to use, again, data sets from the US spy satellite mission, which is called Corona, which acquired since the 1960s in stereo, so which allows us to acquire digital elevation models and has a very, very high resolution. So we use this data set along with aerial photos, which were acquired with the support by National Geographic in 1984 to generate this nice Washburn map of the Mount Everest. And we used in addition the very high recent resolution satellite images. So you just, well, you can't probably see the details, but here you can nicely see there's Inja Lake, which was hardly existing in 1962. It had increased, and now almost the entire glacier tongue of Imja Glacier is gone. But you cannot really see retreat of many other glaciers. But what you can see, when you look at surface elevation changes, so you look at two elevation, digital elevation models of different times, you can look at the down wasting. And these glaciers in Mount Everest, they are heavily covered by debris, which allows also, the, the, the tourist mountaineers to walk over the glacier, um, which is the, so there are less crevasses. And this debris has a specific influence, so the glaciers don't retreat so much, but they are down wasting. And this is what you can nicely see here. So, there, the red color, where the red color prevails, you have a significant surface lowering, and you see that the surface lowering, um, well, increased. Well, wh what you don't see, unfortunately, so this is here, the entire period, so this is 1962 to 2018, and we had overall um, um, surface elevation change on average of about 40 centimeters per year. And the highest lowering was on Barron Glacier, which was more than 120 meters. But also you see at Kumu Glacier, where basically here, here is the ice, uh, the, the um, Everest Base Camp, there was a clear surface lowering, which has a huge impact and when you look at our results, so we had now the, f the most detailed time series of mass changes in this region ever. You look, you see that overall the mass loss increased throughout since 1962 from about 20 centimeters per year to more than 30 centimeters per year. Just to give you an average, so the mass loss of the glaciers in, uh, on the globe is minus 0 0.4, so slightly higher than in the Everest region. But what you also see, what we had before, that there's one glacier which has extraordinarily low, high lowering range. This is Lotse Glacier, which drains into to Imja. 
just to show you that it's why so far almost no persons used corona satellite imagery because it's relatively complex. So you have a complex topography, you have low contrast, so you need some specific expertise to deal with it. But when you develop that expertise, it is really, really a great data set because you have get information from the 1960s and have a resolution of two meters and slightly better. Not only for glossological purpose, but also for glossological purpose. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your interest and National Geographic and Rolex for the support of our project. Okay, with that, we'll open it up for questions. Any questions from reporters in the room? All right. And please remember to state your name and affiliation. I'm Robin Meadows, and I freelance, and I'd like to know what do you guys recommend for protecting the water supply from mountains? And does it vary by location in the world? You want to start? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I think um, yeah, there are several things that you can think of. If you really think of, let's say, water supply, because now, as, as I said in my presentation, snow and glaciers, they have a very important buffering role. So we have to come up with ways to basically replace that buffering role. And one way to do that is, of course, to build reservoirs. But building reservoirs is also associated with all kinds of possible environmental change. So we have to do that in a very careful way. And another thing is what we can do is, uh, I think, for example, making more national parks in mountain regions that would really target uh, conservation efforts specifically towards mountains. And um, yeah, and another point is, I think it's important to put mountains also really on the political agenda, really as a dedicated topic. And I th in the last couple of years, these developments have already started. If you look, for example, at the last IPCC special report on oceans and the cryosphere, there is really a specific chapter dedicated to high mountain areas. So I think these, these kind of developments are uh, the kind of things you should think of. Okay. Can I add two, two and thoughts? The one is, I think it's, it's very clear, but so what is in the, we need immediately to reduce CO2 reductions. So this would not help us immediately because the glaciers will continue to retreat uh, for a certain amount of time, even if we reduce. But in the long run, it's certainly very, very important that, uh, to really save the water towers. And the other issue is that when you have black carbon or deposits on the glaciers which lower the albedo, this will increase the, the melt, not only of, of um, glaciers, but also snow. So basically, reduce emissions is really, really important and to reduce um, by carbon emissions, for example, will have a direct and short-term effect, and that's feasible. Thanks. Um, Jonathan Amos, BBC, I forgot my name there for a minute. <laughs> 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 it's only day one uh, as well. Um, this really goes to the sort of kind of the, the, the difficulty, uh, I think, of um, addressing some of the, the issues here. I think one of the things that struck me most was, was how um, these water towers go across national boundaries. And the, you mentioned political tension because people are in competition for this water. And at the same time, we're asking them to come together to produce policies, strategies, to protect those water towers when they have differing competing interests, as we've already seen. I mean, the RLC is a classic example of, of what happens when this goes wrong. Um, you know, it's almost disappeared uh, because people have been taking water upstream. So, um, I, I, you know, you're scientists, I guess. Um, you can only put the data out there. I just kind of, you know, wonder what you say to the policymakers um, of these different countries' competing interests. Uh, yeah, I think that is one of the, you know, dealing with transboundary issues is one of the most, most critical topics uh, that we are facing. And I think you're right. We as scientists, we, we put out the numbers. But I think that when you, when you see at the scientific developments in the last decade, we are getting much and much better in, 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 in providing those numbers and also at a much, much higher detail. So I think the information we provide with studies like this, they can form a solid basis also for, our, for new water treaties. And if, if I may add, so we as scientists, we talk to each other from these countries. And this is a really, really huge benefit so I had the pleasure to organize during my times when I was still in Zurich, 
uh, meeting of the Indus um, Forum, where scientists from China, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Switzerland, Nepal met and really talked about this issue in a scientific way. And this, these processes are very, very important because we as scientists, we can really talk to each other quite well. We can really inform each other and so basically help to keep the um, conversation going amongst the countries where the highest political level between, for example, Pakistan or India or India and China, there's a difficulty. So this is really an important aspect we scientists can, can do and, and support. Do we have more, any more questions from reporters in the room? Bud Ward with Yale Climate Connections. I wonder if you could address, uh, did your research inform you at all on the issue of timing of snow melt? And if I may be a little bit parochial, could you mention anything in terms of timing uh, in the Pacific Northwest and Colombia? And why is timing important? Yeah, I think, I mean, timing is of crucial importance and what, what we have done now earlier studies have shown for example that the, the snow melt peak comes a bit earlier in the season and also that the total amount of snowfall becomes a bit less because due to the warming you know less less precipitation falls in the form of snow so it's in and when you look at the glaciers then what you see is that the glacial melt season lasts longer but the peak becomes higher so it's really it's really uh, yeah it's it's quite complex to to, to really quantify how all those conspiring processes go together and how that affects the total river flow. So I think if, you, if we now, this is a global study and we used indices to, to give a first indication of how that may change. But I think for the future, we have a lot of work to do to, do to develop really detailed models which account for all these subtle shifts in timing and that also directly link it to what's happening downstream. So we also, th those models also have to be able to deal with, you know, water allocation and water use downstream, connected with a very solid physical based model high up in the mountains. And I think that's still, we still have a couple of years to go before we are there. I'll just uh, add that ahead. certainly the timing question has been particularly highlighted for work in the Indus. Uh, where agriculture is so seasonally dependent. Um, and I'm not aware of that work in Pacific Northwest, but it would be very interesting. Any more questions from reporters in the room? Thank you, good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Brinkhaus from uh, Science Media. I'm just very curious, you mentioned modeling as, as a possible next uh, step in future research, but what are the key areas you guys consider to research in, let's say the next the 10, 15 years ahead? What would be key in research or object objectives? Yeah, I think uh, there, there are several <laughs> points that, we, we, that are really urgent to address. Number one, I think, is, you know, the whole hydrological cycle is driven by precipitation. And we still, if you look at the climate models and how well they perform in mountain regions, they still do a, a, a pretty poor job. And that is because the terrain is so extreme, so we need a much higher resolution to resolve that whole interaction between the atmosphere and the mountains. So that is, you know, only when we get the precipitation right, we can accurately model the, you know, the hydrological cycle. And then the second point is we need, in, for the larger scale models, we need better parameterizations for snow and glaciers to account for, you know, how does the atmosphere really interact with, with we've seen in Tobias' uh, presentation, there are glaciers that are debris covered, there are glaciers which terminate into lakes, and all those processes are not included in the, in the global, global models as of now. Um, I would add in that more instrumental data has also been highlighted, uh, particularly for the water towers that are shown as the most important and the most vulnerable. Um, so we had a large expedition to Mount Everest that aimed to set up these really high weather stations that fill a big and critical data gap. Um, and we hope to have more expeditions like that in other key water towers around the world to fill those critical data gaps to understand more about how those most important water towers are changing. May I add in this point? So this is really, really important that we get suitable data about precipitation and climate in high mountains. Because, well, it's 
you see, it's really, really difficult to climb Mount Everest and costs a lot of money. And this is one point measurements, or, well, it's a, basically a transect, which is really, really important. But there are still, well, it's not possible throughout. What we can do, we can use glacier models and also remote sensing of glaciers to use this information when we know how the mass of the glaciers change um, to really understand about or get a better understanding about precipitation high mountain areas. This was one study done by, by Walter, one study where I caught it, where we really showed that this, the most of the data sets available so far have much too low precipitation information in, in the high mountain areas. So this is really a key um, for both measuring and modeling. Great. Was there a question up front? Or Hey, uh, Andy Revkin, freelance, um, full disclosure, I'm on the, still on the committee, the Grants Committee at National Geographic Society. Um, Long-term data, how do you sustain, it's, it's great to have these sort of expedition style, install instruments, and but what the world needs, maybe it's the remote sensing part, if integration, how do you maintain the capacity, especially in places like the Himalayas where poverty and lack of infrastructure make it so hard to do any science, how do you, how do you make this a long-term data set? Um, I would say both both aspects are desperately needed, more real-time uh, actual data, and then the remote sense data that can be ground truth using the expedition style um, data is really important. For capacity building, um, on our recent expedition, we had, I believe, 17 members from Nepal, and we focused on training graduate students within Nepal. We had 12 different Nepali graduate students as part of our expedition, um, for which we funded their master's degrees as well as gave them extra opportunities in the field. Um, and there just needs to be much more activity like that to support people, particularly in lower income countries, um, to understand about their mountains and their water resources. Uh, we want to really make sure that we're not coming in from outside and creating new data that might not get back to local people. So I think engaging communities is a really important aspect. Um, hopefully there will be more funding towards universities in, in regions around these most important water towers so that we can continue to train the next generation to better understand their own resources. And yeah, and in addition to that, I think it's also important that we also generate opportunity, if, you know, once we all have uh, people from Nepal or from the region in our teams, and then w once they, they finish their masters, it's also essential for them to, to create opportunities to do PhDs in, in their own countries, because what we see, yeah, very often is that, you know, the good students, they go abroad and do a PhD there, and they would like to stay there for good reasons. But I think it's also important that we build the capacity and that, that people are also willing and able to stay in their countries and work on the issues at home. Yeah, and, I, I, okay, go on. Yeah, and, the, and the last point I want, another point is of course, many of these projects are short duration projects. So they go yeah. for three or four years and then weather, weather stations are installed and then after that the funding is gone. But of course, if you wanna do climate change studies, you need 10, 20, 30 years of data. So that is also very complicated. and. Last year, the World Meteorological Organization also organized in Geneva a high mountain summit where they really iterated this to develop this, you know, multi-decadal high mountain observation programs. And I think that is, that is something that is really needed to, to stop these short duration projects. If you really want to build up long time series, we have to do something like that. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to highlight, is really to, to convince also the governments that they plan money to put in long term. Because uh, the problem, I'm running a, a station which, well, it's, it's secured for f five years and then the money is gone. And so I have to apply for funding and funding. And this is a very, very typical situation um, in many countries. Yeah. So we need really long-term secured funding, which is basically provided by funding agencies or specifically donor agencies or you know, um, governments in the countries. Yeah. And may maybe a final remark. In, in for, the, for this question is also, we need also regional organizations. So we work a lot with an organization in Nepal called the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. So they're like really a regional knowledge-based organization. They work in eight countries. They have very good relations, both in the scientific world, but also politically. And you know, those kind of organizations, they should kickstart these regional long-term monitoring programs. Okay, do we have more questions? Yep. 
Um, Robin Meadows, freelance again. When you guys talk about high elevations, what numbers do you have in mind? And does it, is it an absolute or does it vary by mountain range? Yeah, I think the key here is that uh, real science almost entirely happens, uh, sorry, field science almost entirely happens below 5,000 meters above sea level. And once you get above 5,000 meters, there are very few researchers um, who are going to the field and c either collecting snow or measuring precipitation or putting up weather stations. It's incredibly difficult work. Um, so for our Everest expedition, our scientists went up to 8,430 meters, um, and the height of Everest is 8848. So they were just a tiny bit, about a 100-story building below the summit of Everest. Um, and s that was the highest weather station ever. I think above 6,000 meters is also, we have the second highest weather station, which is also ours. Um, these are really difficult endeavors and uh, you need to find people who are adventurous and scientifically minded and can not only climb these mountains but also spend the time to do the work up there at, at deprived of oxygen levels. And um, it's really quite difficult, but we hope that we can support lots more of it in order to um, work around the world in other high elevation regions. Yeah, and during, during the, I think in our first workshop in Washington, we also had this long discussion on what is a mountain. So, I mean, it's, it's not such an easy question to answer. Yeah. It's not basically a threshold by elevation, but it's, so we, we, we have this combination of, of roughness. So if there's a lot of variation in altitude within a certain area in combination with an, an altitude threshold, that is what we defined as high mountain regions. Yeah. And there are, for example, are high mountains here in the US. I did my postdoc in Western Canada, and I realized, well, the highest mountain is, is not 8,000 meters, but it's something like 4,000 meters. Well, it's Mount Logan, it's 4,600 meters in, in, in Canada. But there, I, I learned, I was surprised, it was not already 10 years ago, there were almost no measurements in the high elevations. But there, well, you don't really suffer from, from uh, altitude thickness so much because the, the highest mountains where you can measure are 3,000 meters or even lower. But even there, we are really missing uh, this information. So also here in close to where we are. And it would be good to get more information. Do we have more questions from reporters in the room? Do we have any questions on the chat? All right, well, we're gonna conclude then. And so we have a break until 11. So if you guys wanna stick around and ask the speakers more questions, you're free for the next hour. We'll reconvene at 11 o'clock. Thanks. <laughs>